Good afternoon, everybody in Santa Clara. Um, this is our third and final um, session uh, of the State of the City with the live um, town hall in Santa Clara. Uh, happy Friday, happy Juneteenth to everybody out there um, gearing up for, uh, for what looks like a beautiful weekend. Um, so uh, for the last couple uh, days, uh, for those who may be tuning in for the first time, uh, we've been holding State of the City address um, by our uh, uh, Mayor Lisa Gilmore um, with a city budget update from our uh, city manager Deanna Santana um, with also um, representatives from each council district to present the COVID-19 Community Hero Awards from each district. And so on Wednesday, we kicked it off from four to five um, with uh, the state of the city and the budget update with representation from districts one and two. Uh, yesterday on Thursday, we had districts three and four represented and today we have um, districts five and six uh, represented and uh, Mayor Gilmore will be uh, presenting the Community Hero Awards on behalf of both districts. Um, I'm giving a minute for folks who are uh, dialing in on the phone and so for those who may be watching the live stream or listening on the phone, there are so many different avenues for people to participate in the state of the city and the live town hall questions that will happen later um, in, the, in the session. Um, for those who uh, uh, are on the phone, uh, we have live streams on the city's website. We have it on the city's Facebook and YouTube pages um, where folks can drop comments in the comment section and I'll be more than happy to reload the, the, those comments on your behalf. Um, uh, we're also on channel 15 uh, uh, as well for those who are watching from home. Uh, but folks who want to actually ask the questions themselves are free to call in and dial 877-353-4701 uh, and if you want to ask a question, you can press zero and you'll be placed in the queue to ask a question live later in today's session. Um, so I want to give a, just a, a minute here to uh, get folks who are on the phone to be able to join in and participate um, while I talk about um, uh, the rest of the agenda. Um, so, like I mentioned yesterday, we covered Districts 1 and 2 um, with the Community Hero Awards. Sorry, on Wednesday, we covered Districts 1 and 2, and yesterday with Districts 3 and 4, and today, we'll be covering Districts 5 and 6. Um, we'll start with the uh, welcoming remark remarks from our mayor, um, uh, and then uh, uh, she'll present uh, the Community Hero Awards for both Districts 5 and 6, uh, and then she'll give us the State of the City. Uh, followed by the uh, uh, city budget update from our city uh, manager, Deanna Santana. And then we'll jump, like I said, to the town hall live questions and answers. The questions are unfiltered, of course, for those who may have listened into yesterday and Wednesday's um, uh, town hall. Uh, the questions come as they come. Whether I'm reading them from the comments, I will read them exactly as you've written them for me, or they're on the phone, they are, not, um, they are completely unfiltered, unscripted. So um, if you have a question, cue yourself up on the phone. I'm gonna read the phone number again for those who wanna uh, ask the question via the phone. It's 877-353-4701, and then you can press zero to ask your question or be placed in the queue to ask your question. Or if you drop your question in a comment on the Facebook live stream or the YouTube live stream, um, I'll be able to ask those questions on your behalf. So with that, I will hand it over to our mayor um, for um, her opening remarks. Thank you so much, Hassam, for the introduction and welcome to the 2020 State of the City. I'm Mayor Lisa Gilmore, and although we cannot meet in person today, I want to thank you again for joining us either virtually, uh, by phone, or online. As the city clerk mentioned, we have a full agenda today, which includes uh, special presentations, and I will wrap up with a question and answer period. Uh, hopefully one of us here in the chambers will be able to answer the questions, or if not, we have some of our department heads online. Uh, so we have the resources necessary to hopefully answer most of the questions that we receive. So before we proceed with the agenda, I would just like to take a moment to recognize um, the significance of this day in our country's history. On this day in 1865, Union Major General Gordon Granger rode into Galveston, Texas and issued General Order No. 3, freeing the enslaved men, women, and children of Texas. Juneteenth is celebrated annually on the 19th of June to commemorate the abolition of slavery in Texas 
and other Confederate States of America, ending slavery in the United States. Although the Emancipation Proclamation has been, had been issued on January 1st, 1863, almost three years later, on June 19th, 1865, it was finally read into, in Texas to enslaved African Americans, advising them that they had been freed, albeit, albeit years earlier. Uh, Texas was the last Confederate state to have the proclamation announced after the end of the American Civil War in April of that year. Unfortunately, freedom had been delayed and denied for near, nearly three years. On Tuesday, the Santa Clara City Council will honor and commemorate the last remaining African um, enslaved African Americans in the United States by proclaiming June 19th, 2020 as Juneteenth in the city of Santa Clara. I, along with my council colleagues, and uh, will call upon members of the Santa Clara community to work together to build connections and trust and work towards bringing an end to racism and racial injustices in our country. So if you can, please join us uh, Tuesday evening online or virtually or here in the council chambers um, with social distancing. As you know, we are living in challenging times where nothing seems normal anymore. As a city and as a nation, we have endured months of disruption at home and at work due to the serious pandemic. It would have been easy this year to simply cancel our state of the city uh, that's what other cities are doing and have done. But I think it's important to keep as many traditions as possible, even if it's challenging. In Santa Clara, we do not run away from challenges. So we're going virtual for this year's State of the City. We can't meet in person, but you can still interact with your city leaders. And I think it's as, it's as important this year as it has been in the past. Uh, before we proceed with the uh, Community Hero uh, Award recognition and the state of the particular districts, I would like to recognize my fellow council members. First, uh, there is Vice Mayor Karen Hardy uh, representing District 3. We heard from Karen yesterday. And then we have Council Member Debbie Davis from District 6, Council Member Teresa O'Neill from District 4, and we heard from Teresa yesterday, and she's also one of our very few audience members today. So thank you for your dedication, Teresa, or you can't get enough of this. Thanks for coming back. Um, we also have uh, Council Member Kathy Watanabe that you heard from on Wednesday for District 1 and Council Member Raj Tahal that you heard from on Wednesday from District 2. Um, so that's our city, city council. I would also like to recognize key um, members of our leadership team here in the city of Santa Clara. With us today, we have city manager Deanna Santana and you'll hear from Deanna shortly after my speech. We have also in the room City Attorney Brian Doyle, and we also have our City Auditor Lynn Lamb. She's not with us today, but hi Lynn out there. She does fantastic work for us, and we always could use a good audit, so thank you, Lynn. So um, now it's time for our COVID-19 Community Hero Award recognition. Uh, today, we are going to recognize COVID-19 community heroes from District 5 and District 6, as well as our citywide COVID-19 pandemic hero of the year. The council District 5 is, uh, seat is currently vacant. So I have the great privilege of sharing a few words about District 5 and the state of District 5, as well as presenting the District 5 COVID-19 Community Hero, Hero Award. District 5, up until earlier this year, was represented by uh, Council Member Patricia Mahan. Uh, Patricia Mahan resigned her seat due to personal reasons, so that is why it, the seat is currently vacant. Let me tell you a little bit about District 5. District 5 is a very dynamic and key district in the city of Santa Clara. The history of Santa Clara is contained in District 5 with our historic homes and properties, Mission Santa Clara and Santa Clara University, and many historical resources can be found in District 5. I spent most of my childhood and my adult life either going to school, attending events, or working in District 5. 
My fa family settled in downtown Santa Clara in the early 1900s, and we have seen many changes and some very dramatic changes. My grandfather and his brother had a clothing store in the downtown area was, that was de demolished in the name of redevelopment. Since then, there have been several efforts to bring back the downtown. However, there is a renewed and energetic interest and movement to re revitalize downtown Santa Clara that is underway. So I'm just gonna give you an update on the status of the project without giving any of my own opinions on it since I have a family-owned business in downtown Santa Clara. But this is probably the most visible project in District 5, so I didn't wanna leave it out of the report. The city is undergoing a downtown precise plan and will, that will provide guidance for the new development. And a community task force and a variety of community workshops are happening and the project is scheduled for community-based plan to be completed in the summer of 2021. That's about all I can say about it. Um, for further information, you can contact um, our other council members um, throughout the city or our city manager's office and staff. Uh, D5 also contains a long area of the El Camino, and the El Camino Real Specific Plan is also being developed with future land use issues in mind, and the council will be taking action on the downtown El Camino plan uh, later this year. On the topic of bringing BART to Santa Clara, our city is having ongoing conversations with VTA on the transit-oriented community, communities plan, and VTA anticipates construction on the BART station to commence mid-2022 and substantial construction completed by mid-2028, so stay tuned on that. Santa Clara University occupies a large area of District 5 and houses many students that live off campus. There are many rental units throughout the old quad area of D5 that rent to both undergraduate and graduate students. There is also a Santa Clara University Neighborhood Relations Committee that we call NERC that I serve on with other council members that deals with student, landlord, and resident issues centering around code enforcement issues and neighborhood relations. Ongoing communications with the university and the students and the residents have been essential in fostering a collaborative partnership with um, regarding those issues. And we have made really great progress over the last few years because of our partnership with Santa Clara University and their willingness to work with the city and the neighborhood residents. Some of the more de uh, visible development projects in District 5 include um, the Republic Student and Affordable Housing Project on jointly owned city and VTA land next to our historic train station. Uh, the Hunter Storm Residential Retail and Hotel Project, which is actually in District 2, but it directly affects District 5. And under construction, the Prometheus Project on the previous uh, VSO storage land across from our police department. And also in District 5, we have the Summerhill Senior Housing Project on the El Camino in front of the Target Center. Uh, that project's been delayed. I'm not sure why, we'll soon find out, but it really looks terrible there. So I hope something happens soon because it really needs to be cleaned up. Did you hear that code enforcement? Clean that up, get that cleaned up. Uh, tell the developer. Anyways, and also the Mariani project on the El Camino. Uh, this project is in District 4, but the residents uh, adjacent to the project are in District 5. So that's gonna be an interesting dynamic. Um, when that is brought forward. So I wanna finish uh, by talking about the historic treasures in District 5 that really need to be part of our overall placemaking and community gathering centers. We are fortunate to have the gorgeous campus of Santa Clara University with the newly completed Franklin Street Pedestrian Mall. We have our mission library and park with its serene setting and its lovely gazebo. We have the Carmelite Monastery with its beautiful architecture and splendid garden and trees. And we now have the city-owned Morris Mansion, a California historical landmark and listed under the National Register of Historic Places. This is just a snapshot of District 5. It's truly the heart of Santa Clara. And whenever we have events here, whether it's at the university, the farmer's market, our street dance, or I failed to mention earlier the Parade of Champions. 
District 5 is the place that makes all Santa Clarans feel like they belong and are part of the community. And um, I think that was evident when the Parade of Champions was brought back last year, and just to see the community spirit brought back, the, the, the sense of nostalgia, and just the history, and, and bringing the community together all in District 5. So that's my short update on District 5. Um, so now, on behalf of District 5, I'm pleased to announce the COVID-19 community hero uh, being Mission City Grill. And its owners, Richard Holder, Robert Ramirez, Danny and Anna Holder, and John Holder. In 1957, Jack and Ann Holder opened their Uncle John's Pancake House in Santa Clara and made a splash with their delicious pancakes and waffles. And I know Santa Clara is really a small world. My sister worked at Uncle John's Pancake House back in the 60s, so I remember the pancakes and the waffles. Uh, they went on to open multiple restaurants in various locations, the Country Inn, Jack's, and Mission City Grill in Santa Clara. The Holder family has never stopped giving back to the community, and Mission City Grill operations is no exception. John, Richard, and Danny are hands-on, and Robert Ramirez, an owner and family friend, started working at the restaurant when he was in high school. So this is truly a family and friend venture. Mission City Grill owners have a long history of giving to the community, but their community service has been amplified during the pandemic. They personally deliver meals to seniors, our Bill Wilson Center, several women's shelters, both St. Louis Hospital and Good Samaritan Hospitals, free and reduced meals to our first responders, police, fire, and several hundred nurses. And I know that they have donated not only from their businesses, but also from their own pockets. I am proud to say that they have been a dynamic part of our community for over 60 years and have unselfishly shared food and other resources with the most vulnerable residents in Santa Clara during the pandemic. I want to congratulate this beloved family and business on being named District 5 COVID-19 Community Hero. Thank you, Mayor Gilmore and members of the City Council for this very special award and recognition for Mission City Grill. On behalf of our entire family, we'd like to thank all of our staff for their excellence and commitment to hospitality that has made Mission City Grill the success it is today. In 1957, my parents sold their businesses in Roseburg, Oregon and came to the Valley of Hearts Delight on July the 4th, settling in the city of Santa Clara. Later that same year, they opened Uncle John's Pancake House on the El Camino Real, starting a legacy of family restaurants in the South Bay that has spanned 63 years. Growing up, our parents taught us the value of community and the importance of paying things forward. And this is how our family of restaurants has remained relevant during this challenging COVID-19 crisis. We can be inspired knowing that a sense of humanity will always offer a sense of healing. Collectively, we have served well over a thousand complimentary meals to our deserving heroes, including first responders, police, fire, and 911 dispatchers, nurses and doctors performing on the front lines of our hospitals, our forgotten mothers and children in the women's shelters, our young adults at Teen Challenge, and providing for our youth at the Bill Wilson Center in Santa Clara. We salute our heroes for your dedication and we are inspired by your hope for a better tomorrow. From all of us at Mission City Grill, we thank you for this generous recognition. City Clerk, do we hear clapping online? I hope so. Um, thank you. There's a you. lot of people dropping likes and loves on loves the, uh, on the live stream, so absolutely. Signs. We <laughs> love those little hearts that you drop because that they are so deserving of, of all the accolades we can give them for everything that they've given back to the community and not just now, but in the past. They never stop giving. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mission City Grill. Okay, so now I'm gonna put on another hat and um, talk about District 6. Um, Council Member Debbie Davis was unable to join us today, so I will be sharing some of the updates on District 6 
and present the District 6 COVID-19 Community, Community Hero Award on her behalf. District 6 is a highly diverse and dynamic district as well. The district spans the entire southern border of our city and shares boundary, boundaries with Sunnyvale, Cupertino, and San Jose. It also contains five school districts, Santa Clara Unified, Cupertino Union School District, Campbell Union School District, Fremont Union High School District, and Campbell Union High School District. Some of the property in District 6, close to Stevens Creek, used to be county property, and so that's why you either see node sidewalks, some rolling sidewalks, or the new Santa Clara type sidewalks. And some properties still have the San Jose address, although they were annexed into the city of Santa Clara years ago and belong to the city of Santa Clara. So it's a very interesting district. I am currently a member, uh, a resident of District 6, and my two previous homes have been in different parts of District 6. So it's a district, I can tell you, that either benefits or suffers from the decisions of neighboring cities. Some of the projects that are currently happening or planned in District 6 are the Agrihood project on Winchester Boulevard, which is one of the largest affordable housing projects in the county and contains mixed use and senior apartments. The Agrihood portion will be a community asset and a placemaking area that I think many, not just in District 6, but in other parts of our city will be able to enjoy. Westfield Valley Fair added a three-story addition, including a movie theater, a new three-level flagship Bloomingdale's, as well as many new dining options. Yes, we haven't been to Bloomingdale's yet. Um, but there are talks about expanding further. So we are keeping our eye on that and our ears open uh, because that, again, will affect the residents of District 6 and the entire city as a whole. Uh, the Subaru dealership on Stevens Creek is replacing their showroom, and this project is currently under construction. And the IHOP property on Stevens Creek uh, at Lawrence Expressway is adding a second office building to their, to their site. Um, about two years ago, the city, our city worked out a settlement agreement with the city of San Jose when they were approving uh, the enormous Santana West office project of a million square feet on Stevens Creek Boulevard and Winchester Boulevard. We believe that the developers were not paying their fair share of traffic improvements, and those fees were being waived by the city of San Jose. Uh, Santa Clara has jurisdiction over one side of Stevens Creek, and San Jose has jurisdiction over the other side of Stevens Creek. And we all know what a nightmare traffic can be on Stevens Creek Boulevard and Winchester Boulevard, especially the residents of, of District 6. Uh, so as a result of that settlement agreement, Santa Clara is receiving millions of dollars in funding for transportation improvements and affordable housing in Santa Clara. I, I bring this up because I, because I wanna emphasize how important it is for Santa Clara to work with our neighboring cities and to also monitor their developments at the same time. San Jose is proposing and approving some very large and dense urban village projects up and down Stevens Creek Boulevard. So we are carefully monitoring new development projects in San Jose, especially to make sure that the monies for these traffic improvements are not being waived uh, from the city like they have been in the past. So I also wanna mention on uh, District 6, the road improvements on Prune Ridge Avenue, most specifically the road diet that was installed a couple of years ago. Uh, in certain areas, Prune Ridge is half on District 6 and half in District 5, and then in other areas, it's completely in District 6. Uh, there are strong feelings about the road diet on both sides. Uh, we received a grant to study the extension of the road di diet all the way down Prune Ridge to Winchester Boulevard, but the City Council put this on hold until, until there can be some really meaningful public outreach and input before any decisions are made. We want to make sure that we're reaching the residents in District 5 and District 6 uh, before the city takes any action on that. So um, stay tuned for that one as well. 
San Jose, uh, District 6 also suffers from traffic and those drivers who use our residential streets to cut through dur during commute times, many to access the new Apple campus and expressways and freeways. We are looking at traffic calming measures and also how we can keep our streets safe for our bicyclists, our pedestrians, and especially our school children and students to, as they go to and from school, providing safe routes to schools. The first worker co-op is located in District 6, a slice of New York, and the city has set aside money to study options to help educate, outreach, and provide technical assistance for interested businesses. I wonder how many family-owned or small businesses we could have saved if we, had this in, uh, if we had this infrastructure in place years earlier. One only just can imagine the beloved businesses we had in Santa Clara that we all wish were here. Did I say Wilson's Bakery? No, I didn't, did I? So, um, as I mentioned in the beginning of this outlook, District 6 is a very dynamic, but also a very complex district. From retail, car dealerships on Stevens Creek Boulevard that provide our city with a really healthy tax base, to Kaiser Hospital, our community medical center, to our city's only memorial park, and from the ground-breaking uh, agri-hood site and the worker co-op, our tree-lined residential neighborhoods, including south of Forest, our parks and recreational facilities, to our iconic Stan's Donut Shop in D6, this district is very unique and special. So now, on behalf of Council Member Debbie Davis, I'm pleased to announce the District 6 COVID-19 community hero. Tony and Alba's Pizza and Pasta and its owners, Diana and Al Valores. When, Santa, when California's stay-at-home order went into effect, Diana and Al thought of all the elderly people living alone with no family nearby. They saw a critical need in the community and responded immediately, offering to deliver free medium pizzas from anyone over 70 shut in their home. Since the Facebook offer went viral, Tony and Alba's Pizza and Pasta has delivered hundreds of pizzas to our homebound seniors. This initiative brought an overwhelming response from the community who pitched in with donations and support this much needed service. Tony and Alba's response to the community was featured in the March 25th edition of People Magazine as one of the most inspiring ways Americans are pulling together. But they didn't stop there. D Diana and Al also worked tirelessly to serve local frontline workers, medical professionals, and first responders. And they were one of the first restaurants to offer free food to people in need in our community. They actually reached out to us. Tony and Alba's exemplifies the spirit of community service and love. And I have to tell you, he does these one minute videos every day that I've learned so much. He has, talks about the most interesting things, so you should look them up. And on behalf of the Santa, city of Santa Clara, I congratulate them on being named District 6 COVID-19 Community Heroes. Hi, I'm Deanna Salsici of Valores. And I'm Al Valores. We're owners of Tony and Alba's Pizza and Pasta. Thank you, City of Santa Clara, for honoring our business as a recipient of the District 6 COVID-19 Community Hero Award. Thank you, Councilman Debbie Davis, for nominating us. We would also like to thank our crew and customers that have supported our efforts. We've established a dinner for seniors 70 and older that are homebound and need a meal. We deliver free pizza, salad, and cookies to those in our area. We also have set up a brown bag program to recognize the extraordinary support of all frontline public safety workers. Through this time of uncertainty, we believe in the words, think we, not me, because that's the only way we're gonna get through this together. Again, thank you, be safe, and God bless. And have a slice day. That's how he ends his videos. I don't know if we're talking about all this food, who's hungry? Tony and Alba's, Mission City Grill, Stan's Donuts. Okay, think about us, yeah, no. Um, thank you so much. I mean, there, it's just, it, it's a pleasure to see that kind of response to our community. Um, so proactive too, he, they didn't even wait. They just immediately saw the need and, and did that. So 
Um, so now I'd like to share a few words about the citywide COVID-19 pandemic hero of the year. And this is the person that I selected um, to rep that represents um, what it's like to be um, an involved citizen and a resident here in the city of Santa Clara. Um, I chose Steve Silva, and Steve Silva is, uh, he does work in our fire department, but he's also been a resident of Santa Clara. He's raised his family here. Um, he has his home here. Uh, Steve is one of those people who you never have to ask. He sees a problem, he sees an issue, and he jumps in, whether it's a, a family that has been displaced by a fire or um, a, a, a suicide victim that left a, a, a family member you know, without food or shelter. Or anything. He is the first person that will jump in and help. And he never, ever, ever asks for anything in return. Uh, Council member Teresa O'Neill, who's with us today, uh, told me a story yesterday about Steve Silva and the crab feet at St. Justin's every year that's put on by the Firefighter Foundation where they raise money and they do a really a lot of good in the community. So she told me, every this is just, just describes him, everybody's having fun and dancing and all of a sudden she looks in the corner and there's somebody cleaning up and loading trucks and dumping garbage and just quietly you know, doing the work that others should be doing, but just to make sure it gets done and it makes sure it gets done properly. That's Steve Silva, quietly going around, doing, doing good work for people, asking nothing in return, but giving of himself and sacrificing time away from his family, his friends, uh, anything just to be the first person on the scene to help. When we started our food distribution program for the seniors in, here in Santa Clara, we were working with the city manager's office and the first thing she said was, how are we gonna distribute this food, this weekend food to our seniors? So we called Steve Silva, oh, he was there before we can even hang up the phone. Yes, we'll do it, no problem. How many weeks, do it whenever, as long as it takes. And he organized uh, Jen Panko and others from the, the Firefighters Association to come and help us. And I'll tell you, the seniors love him when he comes to their door, but he is a person who gives of himself, who always gives of himself, who never asks anything in return, who, who quietly goes about his work, who is probably so embarrassed to get this award because he's not used to being in the limelight. He's behind the scenes supporting all of us all the time. It's a person who loves the city of Santa Clara. So, the COVID-19 Pandemic Hero of the Year, Steve Silva. Hi, I'm Steve Silva with the Santa Clara Fire Department and board member of the Santa Clara Firefighters Foundation. I wanna thank Mayor Lisa Gilmore for recognizing me at the COVID-19 Hero of the Year Award. I am so proud to be part of the public safety team, especially with our work delivering meals to seniors during this difficult and unprecedented time. It's an honor to be recognized. I also want to recognize the entire public safety team that continues to serve Santa Clara. Thank you. So as he spoke there, he's, you know, again, recognizing his team. It's not him, it's the team, it's other people. He's just a, an example of what it's like to be, a, you know, a wonderful community citizen here in the city of Santa Clara. And for a special treat, he's here today. So I wanted to give him his award in person. So Steve Silva, if you'd like to come forward. I want to thank uh, the city, Santa Clara, Mayor Gilmore, uh, City Manager Deanna Santana for this award. It, it really, it is a team effort through our fire department and our fire department staff. Uh, our firefighters love our seniors here in Santa Clara. 
Um, they weren't always seniors. One time they were taking care of us, it's our turn to take care of them. And uh, the senior program has really been rewarding for all of us. Not only to deliver the meals, but to meet the seniors, to check in them uh, once a week. Some of them are alone, live alone. Some of them don't uh, have family nearby. So it's good to check up on them and see how they're doing. So it, it's really a treat to do this and thank you very much. See why he's the guy of the year. Yes, thank you, thank you, Steve. Thanks for coming by too. All right, so um, so if we could give a round of applause for all of our winners right now again, thank you. Okay, so now I'd like to um, start the State of the City with a quick overview of priorities that span in multiple areas. I'm pleased to report that we've made some great strides and accomplishments in the last 12 months. Uh, these could not be done without the support of our city council, our wonderful, wonderful city staff, and most importantly, our community. We facilitated the return of the Parade of Champions that had been a cherished tradition in Santa Clara. We opened the rehabilitated Bowers Park, which is designed for children of all abilities. We are installing up to 300 new electric vehicle charging stations for public use. We commissioned the newly renovated Fire Station 8. We processed a new record number of building permits, applications, and we broke ground on new supportive housing uh, that includes 145 affordable units and specifically uh, units reserved for unhoused individuals. And after significant public outreach, we launched a new user-friendly city website. We also continue to focus on strategically managing our resources and have streamlined and updated our hiring practices that have resulted in increased hiring of underrepresented applicants. We continue to actively manage our, our compliance with Measure J and strive to bring more professional management to Levi Stadium. I'm also proud to announce that for the first time nationally, Santa Clara was named the sixth safest city in America, making it to the top 10. These are just some of the high level accomplishments. You can view a list of city accomplishments on our city website. I would also like to acknowledge the positive ratings we continue to receive from our community. In the most recent survey, approximately 67% of residents said the city government is doing a good and excellent job. And these numbers are rising from two years ago. 70% of Santa Clarence also gave positive feedback on how well the city is keeping residents informed. These surveys, real, uh, these surveys reveal how productive we are as a city and how we are continuing to make significant progress in service to our residents. We recognized COVID-19 community heroes at the beginning of today's State of the City. These heroes remind me of why I love the city of Santa Clara. As Santa Clarans, we are rising to the challenges that face us today. There are heroes in every block, in every home, in every restaurant, in police cars, in fire trucks, and hospital rooms. I'm proud of our city. Through this health crisis, we have demonstrated that to protect ourselves and our families, we've had to act as a community. We've had to care about our neighbors as much as we care about ourselves. That's why we wear masks in public. That's why we maintain social distance. That's why we deliver food to seniors who can't shop and to school children who would go hungry without our help. Our emergency response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has reached those who need the city's help the most. Here are just a few of the many things we've been able to do to help Santa Clarence. First, we have our supplemental food distribution program called Healthy Meals Santa Clara and our weekend senior meals to go. Uh, when we first brought the healthy meal, uh, the, the fact that our school children were not getting their school meals on the weekend, and that our seniors were going out without their meals on the weekend, the city council went to the city manager and she immediately said, oh no, we have to feed these babies. 
We have to feed these babies. And she was talking about the students, not the seniors, but so she immediately jumped into action and, and we worked with the school district. Uh, they were very cooperative. We worked with the school district and came up with the plan uh, for the food distribution, which happens every week now. And the, the beautiful part of the food distribution, it's our city workers that are out there uh, distributing the food to the, to the children in need. Uh, so uh, ditto that on the senior meal program. Uh, our seniors were not getting their weekend meals as well. And many of our seniors are afraid to leave their homes, get to the grocery stores, another thing, and they really rely on the city and the senior center, especially for their weekday meals. So we started the weekend meal program, and that's where Steve Silva came in and the, and the firefighters uh, that helped us uh, distribute um, those meals as well. And then we had our community partners like Great America that helped us, we, we used their kitchen and Intel that provided money and others that provided money as well. So it's been a real community effort. But the fact is we're feeding our residents, especially the residents in need. We also have a utility shutoff moratorium, an eviction moratorium, uh, we have a small business assistance grant program that we have distributed very quickly over a million dollars to uh, needy businesses, especially those that have been closed during the shelter in place and have not been able to open the non-essential businesses that are suffering. There's a huge need still out there and we're still looking for community partners to help us with that. But our city staff got that um, under the council's direction. They got that program off you know, right away to get those needed monies to, to our businesses, our small businesses in the city. We had a utility, utility bill credit of $30. And um, I also just finished up uh, a round of mask up with the mayor program. I went around with my fellow council members to dist all the districts uh, over the last six weeks in the city of Santa Clara and handed out masks from the city of Santa Clara to residents in need. And it was really amazing how many residents we had out there that needed masks. We had the disposable and the reusable masks that needed masks and we're very grateful to the city pr to provide those masks for them. So we're gonna do another round pretty soon and, um, and make sure that everybody has a, masks and a mask um, to keep safe and healthy in our community. So I wanna thank my fellow council members, especially uh, Teresa O'Neill and Kathy Watanabe. They've been with me almost every week going out to each district. Um, so help, thank you for, for helping with that. And just this week, we've launched the Emergency Rental Assistance Program that will assist low-income households with past due rents due to COVID-19. Even with all that we've accomplished, we are continuing to work to deliver new services to help our community. We are working with the County of Santa Clara to establish a free COVID-19 testing site in our city, hopefully next week or by the end of June, we're hoping, city manager. Uh, and we also announced this week that one of our most popular programs in the city of Santa Clara, our 2020 annual cleanup campaign is happening and will take place August 10th through September 4th. And I know a lot of you have been cleaning your homes and apartments and have a lot of stuff that is built up to either donate hopefully or um, put out for the cleanup or other people recycle and reuse some of the things we have. So. I think it'll be a robust year for, for um, uh, the, the curbside pickups. Uh, so I'm really proud and grateful for all these efforts because all these efforts took you know, Herculean efforts to happen and happen quickly. And I think that's the dynamic of the city of Santa Clara that we can move, even though we're a larger city, but we can move quickly when we see a need. And we're still moving, we haven't stopped. We keep identifying new areas that we need of our community and our community members we need to support. So we do what it takes to keep our community together during this pandemic, which may continue for many months. We are not sure at this time, we are just um, waiting, watching, and trying to keep our residents healthy. So now, as you know, we also face another major challenge. A tragedy occurred in Minneapolis on Memorial Day. George Floyd died tragically, terribly, under the knee of a police officer. The world saw George Floyd plead for help. The world saw George Floyd beg to breathe. The world saw George Floyd die. And this world, our world will never be the same. 
As mayor, I feel a sense of duty to make some sense of this tragedy by making Santa Clara a better place. As a mother, I feel compelled to do what I can to leave a better world for my children and for everyone's children. That's why I signed a former President Barack Obama's call to address the police use of force. It's a call for a common sense approach to evaluate our policies. No city or community can ignore what happened and the issues that have been raised about race and justice. First, we will review our use of force policies. Second, we will engage our community in the discussion. Third, we will report our findings and seek feedback from our community. And fourth, to improve public safety, we will reform any policies we need to. This is an important pledge and a commitment for me as mayor. I'm proud to say that these efforts, with on these efforts, I will be working and our council will be working cooperatively with our police chief, Pat Nikolai, who is committed to keeping Santa Clara safe for all Santa Clarans. Uh, let me conclude by saying that I decided to focus the majority of my remarks today on two enormous and historic challenges. We have much work to do on both and many accomplishments in other areas. But we as a city must meet head on this health crisis and deal with the issues of race and justice if we are to hand over a great city to the next generation of Santa Clarans. I've lived in Santa Clara for two generations. I'm raising my three children here. My father was mayor in the 1960s and as residents and as a family, we've seen our city deal with a lot of changes and a lot of challenges. I know as well as anyone that the state of our city is strong and our community is resilient. Thank you again for virtually being here with us. And I would like to now invite our city manager, Deanna Santana, who will come up and provide us with a budget update. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon. I just want to provide some updates on our city's fiscal condition in light of um, the council considering the budget next Tuesday and the impacts of COVID and the um, economic recession. Let me get the I think when you hear the stories of our local heroes, the contributions of the city council and our community and the performance of city staff, when you hear the news of our fiscal impact, you will know that we will get through this. Santa Clara has heart and we have, or our spirit is there to make sure that uh, we survive the impacts that we have. So I will go through very quickly since we are over time. Um, first, I just wanna explain that Santa Clara itself is a very complex dynamic organization. We have four lines of service, which is very uncommon for a city of our size, as well as just any municipal organization. We have our city of Santa Clara where we provide our municipal services, the Silicon Valley Power, which is our municipal electric utility, stadium over, the Stadium Authority, which uh, owns the Levi Stadium, as well as the Convention Center where we offer a lot of entertainment and conference space. Our portfolio is on an operating side, it's about $1.3 billion per year. We have over 1,000 full-time equivalent staff and our assets are about 3.5 billion. That's just like facilities and other types of property that we have. So we have a large portfolio also for a city of our size. Uh, going the wrong way here, excuse me. Um, in our budget, we do show how the dollars are distributed. Here is just a scan over between our capital improvement program, operating budget, and our stadium authority. When we put together our budget, we have started with the tradition of putting in place a 10-year general fund forecast so that we are able to strategically plan for our years out. And included in the 10-year general fund forecast is also um, known risk factors that could impact our fiscal outlook. 
Last year, we presented eight known risk factors uh, and just wanted to put those on the council as well as the public's radar that we were watching and monitoring these issues to understand how they may impact our, our fiscal outlook. In January, we were able to present at the policy priority setting session for the council that four of the eight had already re been realized and we put the values there as you see on your screen for the, um, for the known risk factors and how they were looking uh, by, by, by way of impact to the budget. And at that time, we estimated $11.4 million. The blue highlighted items in bold are known risk factors that have now occurred that we are also reflecting now in our budget. That's the economic slowdown, some operating budget impacts, as well as development impact projects. And when I say development projects, just uh, delayed development projects. We're not, we're not, um, our experience and um, what, we're, what we have by way of impacts is not unusual. We're like many other surrounding cities, as well as following the trend of the nation. Here you'll see on this slide is that we are clearly in an unprecedented economy and um, being impacted by both a pandemic, a public health crisis, as well as an economic crisis. These numbers on the chart here reflect as end of May. And what you have in front of you is 43 million unemployment claims. I know this week it was reported an additional 1.5 million, and so the numbers continue to go up. We also have experienced unprecedented market losses, which in, does have an impact on the city's budget by way of CalPERS and pension contributions, as well as to the extent that um, we maintain an unstable status for COVID or experience any spiking, any prolonged shelter-in-place orders that impact our businesses will continue to have impacts on our economy. For our public, for our public agencies, these are some headlines that have recently been shared with other, from other cities, and certainly Santa Clara has been, show, we've been able to share with the community what our impacts are. But just to understand in greater context how other cities are experiencing COVID, um, you'll see there Palo Alto has already expressed a $40 million loss. They have begun the process of layoffs with public safety and non-public safety staff. San Jose has projected 110. I, I believe they have made adjustments, but they are clearly also um, have an unprecedented shortfall. We have cities like El Cerrito who are um, trying their hardest to prevent bankruptcy, um, and other cities like Salinas who have already laid off a third of their employees and Monterey having just um, announced that they have laid off 87 employees. So here is where we can share our numbers with respect to how Santa Clara has been impacted. In April, we shared that we had a $13 million shortfall over the next four fiscal years. That has now tripled or near tripled to about $34 million. We have um, in the current fiscal year a $10 million shortfall and for fiscal year 2021, we're looking at 22.7. These are numbers and forecast um, uh, it, revenues that, and expenditures that were made at end of March, given the trend of April um, and, and so on, we anticipate that these numbers can likely get worse. We immediately, as soon as this Im the impacts were starting to be observed in March, we put in forward some very strict cost control measures so that we could address the $10 million that we face in the current year. These practices will be carried forward into the, the next fiscal year such as a hiring freeze, stricter expenditure controls. We've already um, released our temporary staff 50%. That means about 450 employees um, and is hundreds of thousands of staff capacity hours. Um, we've limited travel, training, we've reduced IT expenditures, as well as looked at cost controls for fleet purchases and contracts and other non-personnel expenditures. In terms of um, our strategy for next fiscal year, it falls into three categories, and I'll cover them on the slide by way of um, revenue. We are going to be presenting the results of a community survey for potential ballot measures for the city council to prepare for an, whether it wants to add a uh, ballot measure in August, but June 23rd, that conversation will begin. We will continue our cost controls, as I mentioned already, as well as we're working with our labor 
bargaining units to see if there's an employee participation role. And as a last resort, we understand that the services that our community needs, um, we have stated clearly that potential layoffs are our last resort and that is a value that we're trying to carry forward. We have um, built up our reserves, so our reserves play a role in how we um, prepare for these shortfalls. We have a $79 million reserve you will see next week as part of the um, budget uh, presentation that we do re request that the council consider drawing down from the reserve, and we'll have that discussion on Tuesday. I wanted to just characterize the problem that we face with our general fund just so that um, the, the community, the council, as well as employees and residents watching understand um, why this becomes a little bit more challenging and why the impacts are felt harder. The city has approximately just shy of a $300 million general fund. 35% of that is already focused on fixed costs. That's everything from insurances, debt, CalPERS costs, as well as other um, commitments that the city has already made. That leaves about 70%, roughly 200 million, of how to fix the deficit. Um, and it falls uh, evenly between non-public safety services and public safety services. And just to characterize by way of magnitude, these are not proposals, and this is um, obviously not what the city would put into place, but just for people to understand what the numbers mean. Um, the the 22.7 would mean the entire Parks and Rec Department would need to be eliminated, one half of the fire department or one third of the police department. That is um, purely just to offer magnitude and scale. In terms of potential ballot measures, the council will be hearing data on a, the community survey next Tuesday on a transit occupancy tax. And the way to look at this chart and read it is if you look at the 2% um, column, you will see the general fund revenue is roughly $3 million. That means that that revenue would have the opportunity to save 12 sworn positions or 18 non-sworn positions. And so we want to be transparent around how this revenue um, would have impacts with respect to service delivery. There's lots of opportunities to still engage on the, on the city's budget. We are presenting next Tuesday the budget. We're going to quickly come back in the late August, September timeframe with revised numbers so that the council consider, can consider additional action on this budget in September as well as in December. This is something that we want to stay on top of. We want to keep the community aware as these numbers change and make sure that our council is equipped with good data so that it can make the best decisions for our community. In closing, I just want to acknowledge that um, we have an incredible one, I want to acknowledge the um, incredible work that the council has done over the year in policy decisions and the courageous leadership that it has practiced with respect to um, the, challenge de the challenging decisions to, on COVID services and all of the um, programs that we've been able to quickly offer. I also want to thank our employees who make a huge contribution to the performance of the city. They are the backbone on providing service, and when you see them, um, converting to disaster workers so easily and so proudly, it really shows the, the, the quality service that the city gets. As well as there's just a host of names that I don't have in front of me, so I'm going by memory here. Nadine, Kendra, Robin, Derek, Lon, all of our communication staff in um, helping with providing a virtual state of the city. It wasn't easy, there was a lot of logistics, and we have been flawless in the delivery. So thank you, and with that, we're prepared to answer questions. Spray? Yeah. It takes two of us to do this. <laughs> 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 oh, Sam, do you want to get us started? Yep. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor Gilmore and uh, City Manager Santana for uh, the State of the City and the budget overview. Um, now, at this point in the uh, in the uh, in the agenda, we're going to actually jump to the uh, live town hall questions. Um, we have a couple people who are queued up on the um, 
on the phone lines. Again, if you are listening in on the phone lines and you want to ask your question, press zero and you'll be added to the queue. Um, the phone number for those who want to ask questions live is 877-353-4701. And then once you're on the phone, you can press zero to be added to the queue. Uh, if you're watching on our Facebook and YouTube uh, live streams, you're, you're welcome to ask your question in the comments section and I will read those questions on your behalf. So with that, we're gonna start with the very first um, uh, call-in question um, from Michelle. So if we can unmute Michelle. Hello, yes, thank you for taking my call. So my question today was, what are we doing about uh, the Mission City Park where I have lots of loved ones who are resting there, that the facility is not being kept up to par. There's already been issues on that last year in September, as you all well know. And the grass is rotting and uh, et cetera. The grounds are not being kept up. And also, when is it going to return to full uh, COVID uh, re restrictions are going to be lifted. The second part of my question is about the, uh, the dog park at Reed and Lafayette. So what is the, what is the plans to finish that and when is it going to be open to the public? Thank you. So this is an area where we have some exciting news and that we are preparing for um, full week uh, openings. And I'm going to invite our director, Jim Teixeira, to provide those details and respond to those questions. Hello, this is Jim Tisher, Director of Parks and Recreation. Uh, in regards to uh, Mission City Memorial Park, uh, we are, uh, as of today, open uh, five uh, days a week for visitation for up to 100 uh, persons in the park at one time. So uh, we're open uh, two mornings uh, and three afternoons per week. Uh, this is also based on making sure that we're still uh, able to provide our grounds maintenance or uh, funerals and um, uh, take care of people's needs. Um, in terms of the uh, earlier issues that was mentioned, um, we do have a project to look at the uh, Sarah Fox mausoleum. Um, and uh, so we are taking care of that as well as some of the other uh, areas of the park that uh, over time, based on being 150 years old, there are some areas of the park that uh, do need additional um, maintenance due to ground settling. And then on the dog park, um, the good news there is that um, as the sports park finishes up, uh, the contractor will be then moving on over to the uh, dog park. Uh, we're probably another two months out on the sports park. Uh, we were delayed about two months on uh, based on COVID uh, restrictions on construction, but uh, the crews have been out just this uh, week. We got the uh, turf lawn has been uh, put in, so uh, we're moving forward on the dog park as well. All right. Thank you, uh, Jim. Um, so we're going to move over to the next uh, caller uh, uh, who's in the queue. Uh, can we please unmute John? Hello, and uh, thank you for answering all of our questions. Um, I was just wondering, I uh, live near the Lawrence Station area, that shopping center, and uh, there doesn't seem to be like any healthy food options like a Trader Joe's or Veggie Grill or just anywhere that might offer something like that, like Whole Foods. It'd be great if there was uh, something walkable um, and that was kind of more like the Santa Clara Town Center type of feel. Um, and I know that Albertsons has been uh, vacant for quite a few years uh, now. So I was just wondering if that area was going to eventually um, offer more like, healthy options and also if it could, uh, I don't know, basically like it was going to get a sprucing up. It would be great to uh, have walkable options in this area of town. <clears throat> Thank you uh, for that question. So in the Lawrence Stations, Lawrence and El Camino area, well, there are three key uh, retail centers in that area. And uh, one of those centers is, um, was the former Kmart shopping center. And that is being redeveloped by the Essex, Essex and they put in the housing 
although I think I remember we asked that the retail go in first, but as you can see, the retail hasn't come in, but there's supposed to be about 100 to 150,000 square feet of retail on that site, which will include um, uh, food options and restaurant options. I'm not sure yet whether or not there's a grocery store they haven't. They haven't told us that. We've been trying to get a Trader Joe's in Santa Clara for a long, long time. And what we have been told always is we just didn't have the density and the critical mass of people uh, to be able to support a Trader Joe's. I disagree. I think the city would really support a Trader Joe's. But we will keep trying on Trader Joe's. The other uh, shopping center is where the drive through Starbucks is and um, Lucky's the Lucky Center over there, and they have some vacancies over there as well. And I, as far as I know, um, that site isn't up for any type of redevelopment. I was hoping at some point it would be, as well as I'll call it the Chili Center, Lawrence Square. Uh, that site is mainly vacant right now, and there were, there were rumors previously that there was going to be a development project there, a mixed-use development project, but um, maybe our community development directors on the line, Andrew Crabtree, I hope he's on the line, uh, to let us know, have there been any applications for any of those two uh, shopping centers on either Lawrence, uh, the Lawrence Plaza where Chili's is or the other side where Lucky's is, and maybe an update if you have it on the Essex Center because that area of town is just thirsting for some food alternatives and restaurant and, and grocery store alternatives, I completely agree with you. It's ripe for that, and, and there's three opportunities there, and at least one we've approved, the Essex site, but I don't know, Community Development Director, if you have any, any information on any of those three sites. Thank you, this is Andrew Crabtree, a Director of Community Development. So first, with the Essex site, as you just said, the, the City Council previously approved um, a commercial development on the front part of that site that would go along with the housing, um, a number of, of small restaurants and, and other commercial buildings. And after a couple of years, um, we did have a, a developer get together the financing and come in and start the, um, the process to sort of complete their, their planning review. Um, that's moving forward uh, despite the uh, the current um, uh, pandemic conditions that uh, developers continuing to to proceed with that application and so um, you know if all goes well we could be seeing some construction out there in the next um, year or so on the um, site across where the um, the drive-through Starbucks is and I've had some conversations with the property owner there. There's really a, a lot of different property owners for that property. So, um, you know, all of them would have to sort of collectively decide that they wanted to pursue some sort of redevelopment. Um, our general plan does support that if, if there, there is an interest there in uh, redeveloping that. And that's also, you know, as you, as you talked about earlier, the El Camino Real specific plan um, is in process that sort of that, that continues to support the redevelopment and also provides more um, definition around design standards and other things to address community concerns. And then lastly, on the, uh, the um, Lawrence um, Plaza property there, um, we don't have anything active on that at the moment. We have had from um, over the last few years at different points, uh, developers look at that site, um, but we don't currently have anything on file, but again, um, per the uh, the general plan and the El Camino Real specific plan, that's a site that would uh, support uh, future redevelopment with with commercial uses that would have more of a pedestrian type orientation. Um, thank you. I just wanted to make a point because I have uh, Councilmember O'Neill here in the room, and yesterday she talked about the Moonlight Shopping Center on the El Camino. I think it's it's our intention, at least with this council, to preserve and support any retail opportunities in our city. And those are all key retail locations. Um, and if you see the success of the town center, I think as, as John the caller had mentioned, uh, there's an absolutely huge need for this in our community. So we want to preserve, those are our key locations, both on El Camino and Lawrence. And, um, the Moonlight Shopping Center on El Camino and Kylie, as Councilmember O'Neill mentioned yesterday. 
Awesome. We're going to move over to some questions from the live stream comments. Um, we have one question from uh, YouTube comments uh, from Sudhir765K, who asks, uh, one large church in Santa Clara, uh, North Valley Baptist Church, is open and hundreds of people are attending services. Do they have the permission from the city or county? Is this a responsible thing on the church's part during COVID times? How is the city dealing with them? City manager. I, I would like to see if our emergency services manager is on the line to talk about the court, the county's order. Yes, hello, this is Lisa Schoenthal, the city's chief emergency services officer. Uh, I can offer, uh, to our knowledge, uh, the North Valley Baptist Church is holding drive-in church services uh, with a maximum of 100 cars that is in compliance with the county order. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna move over to another question from the comments. Um, there, this is, two people asked similar questions. Uh, Kimberly asks, where can I find more information on Santa Clara's commitment to action? And Aurora is asking, how does someone get involved with the Obama pledge? If you look at the um, Santa Clara Police Department's website, we have a commit to action website that has all of the recent information um, that we have put out a community letter. There's videos from the mayor as well as the police chief. Um, and there's an opportunity to get up to speed on the actions as well as on June 23rd, the council will be speaking publicly um, about getting prepared for this community engagement. Mayor? Um, thank you. I also wanted to mention we do have um, actually two commissioners that are coming to our city council meeting on Tuesday to talk about um, how, you know, they envision we might even start um, appointing an ad hoc committee to work on a plan, not just the commitment to action, you know, with our police department, which um, both the police chief and I have, have signed and have committed to, but how we get the community involved with um, with further action, more long-term solutions to this. Well, so we're gonna look at short-term, long-term, and we would, would, would um, very much welcome involvement from the community. So we're gonna start to lay out the framework for how everyone can get involved with this. So I would recommend um, tuning in or watching a replay of our Tuesday night council meeting and just to keep in, you know, informed with us or contact my office and we can, you know, talk to you and let you know what's happening. But um, if you watch our council meeting on Tuesday, you'll see as we start to develop our framework for how we're gonna deal um, with the commitment to action and uh, future more permanent solutions here in the city. Thank you. Um, Warren asks, when can we get fiber internet from SVP, from Silicon Valley Power? Thank you. Yeah, this is uh, Manuel Pineda, Chief Electric Utility Officer. Um, SVP does uh, currently have what's called a dark fiber program where we lease uh, fiber out. However, we don't have a program to offer internet. Uh, this would not be, uh, this is not a, a current uh, thing that we do. It would be a major undertaking to move forward with a new program like this. And there will be uh, significant issues and hurdles that will have to be overcome. It's not uh, something that's currently on our program and our focus continues to be making sure we maintain the lowest uh, electricity rates uh, in the county. So it's not something in our program, uh, and it would be a long-term uh, planning effort to try to accomplish something like that. Thank you, Manuel. Um, while I have you on the phone, Claudia asks, um, <laughs> um, Bowers and Central, on Bowers and Central Expressway, there are large data centers. How do those centers affect our utility bill? Actually, having uh, large generators like data centers uh, help uh, keep our utility rates uh, low. Uh, when you think about providing electricity services, there is a number of base costs that you have to account for, meaning the uh, transmission and distribution, which is another way to put it, is just uh, the poles and wires, as well as the operations and maintenance. When you have large users like data centers, you can spread out those costs over a, a, a uh, over more customers and actually keeps the rates low. And so on again, I, I would like to highlight that for residential rates, we have the lowest rates of any uh, public utility or any utility 
with more than 5,000 customers in the entire state of California. That's for residential rates. So we're very uh, proud of that to be able to provide that service to the community. Awesome, thank you, Manuel. Um, I know we have a bunch of questions that have come in um, from the last two sessions and today on the comments and, and folks on the phone. Um, we're a little bit over time, so what I'll promise is that we're gonna maybe take two more questions, and then um, what we'll do is we'll compile a list of maybe some of the most asked questions, or at least questions that we didn't get to, um, and we'll po uh, post it on the city's website um, uh, you know, with the links to the video replays. Some folks asked questions like yesterday that got answered today, so you know, they'll also have links to the video replays to be able to watch the answers to their questions. And then, of course, we can always take questions um, in any of the public city meetings uh, that are not on the agenda. There's always a section or a session for uh, public questions, but certainly we'll answer some of the questions and post those answers online um, for those that we didn't get to or at least the frequently asked ones. So um, for today, we'll take maybe two more questions if that's okay um, and then we'll, we'll we'll wrap it up for a, for, a, for the weekend um, so um, Fran is asking there was an article from Lloyd Alabin regarding the megaplex to be built across the street from Levi Stadium will this plan replace the reclaiming our downtown project the article suggested it would and I did check this is an article from last year and I think she's referencing um, okay mayor Gilmore Okay, she might be talking about City Place project yep. um, on the city's golf course on the landfill. So um, first of all, nothing can replace our downtown. They are co two completely different projects. In fact, we call that one Uptown and then our downtown. Um, Santa Clara is almost the tale of two cities where we have our uh, traditional areas around Santa Clara University, our previous downtown that was knocked down during the redevelopment of the 60s, and um, uh, what's envisioned for downtown is not anywhere near what would what is proposed for uh, across from Levi Stadium. So the project across from Levi Stadium, it's, it's an interesting project because the city owns the land. Our residents, we all own that land. So not only will that land be providing um, it's an entertainment, restaurant, retail, entertainment, office, housing project. Um, not only will that be providing uh, amenities for the city, especially for those who live and work in North Santa Clara, but will also be providing a good, healthy cash flow to our general fund so that we can provide um, public safety and community services and parks and recreation uh, for our community, our basic city services. Uh, the downtown project is, is completely different and it's, it's more uh, close to home, hometown, and um, trying to replace what was there from years past, uh, similar to downtown Campbell or downtown Los Gatos and other areas. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Gilmore. Um, Will asks on the YouTube comments, he says, what is the status of the zoning code update? I believe this was supposed to be reviewed in the spring. Andrew, are you on the line still? Yes, I am. Uh, again, this is Andrew Crabtree, a director of community development. Um, our zoning code uh, was comprehensively updated last in uh, 1969. So it's you know, over 50 years old and in much need of work. And we have been um, working out, we had a number of outreach meetings and workshops last year, and really we're going through the um, careful review with uh, the city attorney's office and making sure that everything in the code is um, in alignment legally with each other and, and that it's a very sound document. So that's where we are currently um, with various other things going on. Um, we've had to, uh, had some delays with it, but we do expect to bring the zoning code uh, to the city council for adoption towards the end of this year or very early in the next year at the latest. All right, like I mentioned, we have a lot more questions on the queue, um, but uh, for the sake of time, since we are over by almost 20 minutes right now, um, what we'll do is we'll commit to uh, collecting uh, the questions that were not answered or the ones that were asked uh, uh, repeatedly and posting it on online with links to the uh, all three sessions. Um, we had a wide variety of questions that were asked um, and, uh, you know, 
many different kind of questions each day, actually. It was, uh, it was a unique set of questions each day. So um, certainly, if you haven't watched yesterday or Wednesday's session, um, there are a ton of great questions and answers that were, um, that were addressed there. Um, and you can also watch the, um, uh, and honor the uh, Community Hero Awards from the other districts that were not mentioned today. So again, uh, those, all those uh, live streams, those um, replays will be available online, and we'll compile the list of uh, questions and answers um, for questions that weren't addressed. And with that, we're gonna close the questions and answers session of the town hall, and I'm gonna hand it back to you, Mayor Gilmore. Thank you so much. I just wanna say that um, this is an unusual state of the city event, but it, it really took a village to put this all together and to have three of them actually. So I apologize to all the staff members who had to hear me three times say the same things. Um, please accept my apologies. But I really wanna thank the council members for giving us their district reports. Uh, for our city clerk, Hassam Agog, for being our moderator. We appreciate it. You do such a good job um, doing that. You did such a wonderful job. And thank our city manager for the report and the communications team and everyone in the city manager's office, city attorney's office. Um, depending on the situation, depending on where we are, uh, maybe towards the end of the year, we might do another State of the City if it's in person and we can have our public here because we're really missing seeing the public both at our council meetings and at the State of the City. But as things get a little more um, back to what we consider normal, um, I'm hoping that we can do something towards the end of the year. So on behalf of the City Council and all of my colleagues, I want to thank you for joining us for um, to this virtual town hall, State of the City 2020. And I hope all of you have a great weekend. Thank you.